I love the way they've provided me with a glass of water, as if this is going to be a long speech. <laughs> this is going to be a very short speech, because I'm really going to repeat what I said last night at the gala dinner, which is that this showcase is all about recognizing and celebrating all of the achievements of all of the teachers of English who have participated in ProAlt, in ProAlt phase one and in ProAlt phase two. You all know this, but let me remind you all that the ProAlt training program is a huge commitment by the Ministry of Education to support the professional development of teachers of English across the whole country. The program is owned by BIELTEC, the English Language Teaching Center, but it was initially kick-started, the first phase, the pilot was kick-started with funding by Pamandu. And we, the British Council, are hugely proud that we've been chosen by the ministry to be th their partner in delivering this program. And I personally, and, and the entire British Council network, is hugely proud of all of the work done by our excellent trainers across the whole country. And I mentioned this number, but I want to repeat it because I think it's quite staggering as a sense of the scale of what's happening here. Is that through ProOut 1 and 2, there's well over 5 million contact hours between trainers and teachers in classrooms and teachers accessing materials online. 5 million contact hours. That's a huge, as I say, investment by the Ministry of Education, but much more significantly, it's a huge investment by all of you, the teachers. That's an enormous amount of time that you have put into developing and uh, your own professional development. And uh, I, I deliberately asked for a round of applause last night to, to celebrate that fact. You heard from two of the, the veteran teachers last night, two very honest voices about uh, some of the initial lows, but the highs uh, and, and the experience and the learning that they took from Pro Art One. And as I mentioned, today is really the opportunity for many more voices to be heard, for all of you to talk about, to share, and to have celebrated your achievements, your learning, and what you're planning on doing going forward. Thank you very much, everybody. I hope the day is a huge success. Enjoy yourselves. And as I said, ProELT is a very clear example of that kind of belief in the value of teachers. It's not possible to achieve significant change in education without achieving significant change in the quality of teaching. We can invest in resources, we can invest in technology, we can invest in all other kinds of supporting material, but the fundamental, the crucial uh, ingredient is the quality of teachers. Unless that is there, uh, nothing else really matters that much. So I say it's great to see that in Malaysia generally there seems to be a very wide recognition of this fact. Uh, ProELT represents a very significant investment, not just financially, but in terms of time, of resources in improving the quality of teachers. And therefore, it's almost inevitable, although one of our challenges is to demonstrate that, but it's almost inevitable that improvements in the quality of learning must follow. It's almost inevitable. So let's think a little bit about what contributes to teacher quality. When we think about good teachers or good quality teaching, what are, what are the characteristics of quality teachers. And that leads us to think about the concept of teacher knowledge. Uh, good quality teachers, in essence, are knowledgeable. And there are many types of knowledge that teachers have, that teachers need. But I'm just going to focus on two today, two which are particularly relevant to ProELT. Now, the first of these is knowledge of the subject, which in our case is a knowledge of English. Uh, ProELT invests significant time and energy in improving uh, teachers' language, teachers' English. And in fact, that is one of the key indicators of success for the program. And there's no doubt that subject matter knowledge is fundamental to teaching quality. You can't have good quality teachers unless they have sufficient knowledge of the subject they're teaching. Just as we expect a mathematics teacher to be well-versed in mathematics, and just as we wouldn't expect a science teacher to be very good if they didn't know much about science, 
The same, of course, applies to teachers of English. Subject matter knowledge is very important. What's special about languages, of course, is that subject matter knowledge has different dimensions. There's the uh, declarative dimension. In other words, language teachers need to know about the nuts and bolts of the language, the system. They need to be able to analyze language, to explain language. But of course, language teachers need the procedural knowledge. They need to be able to use the language to communicate. Now, neither of these on their own are sufficient. And that's easy to illustrate. Let's take declarative knowledge, the ability to analyze language, to explain grammar, for example. That on its own is not enough to contribute to good quality teaching. If that were the case, every linguist would automatically be an effective language teacher. And we know that that's not the case. Similarly, the ability to use the language effectively in a, in a communicative sense alone is not enough for good quality teaching. And again, if that were the case, every competent user of the language would automatically be a good teacher. But again, we know it's not the case. Teachers need declarative knowledge. <coughs> Teachers need procedural knowledge of the language. But even those two together are not enough. As you all know and will appreciate, teachers also need knowledge of methodology. They need to know how to teach. Again, it's clear that this importance of both subject matter knowledge and knowledge of teaching are recognized in ProELT because it invests significant time in both. Now you'll notice from this picture that the circles overlap and that's on purpose <clears throat> because when we think about knowledge of the subject and knowledge of teaching although we can think about them as two separate types of knowledge in practice, good quality teachers use both of them together. And if we think about what good quality teachers do, they are able to use their knowledge of the subject to plan and deliver effective teaching. So in a sense, they're using their knowledge of language and their knowledge of teaching in an integrated manner. And I think this has implications for teacher training and teacher education as well. And I think that, too, is to a certain extent reflected in the design of ProELT. And ProELT approaches language and methodology in a way that brings them together, that's integrated. Knowledge is important, not only for its own sake, of course, and because it allows teacher to plan and to deliver lessons in an informed way, but also because it has an impact on confidence. And I think competence is also another attribute of good teachers that we shouldn't underestimate. In fact, it's possible to think of situations where a teacher who has maybe less knowledge but is more confident is able to teach in a way that is more effective than a teacher who is more knowledgeable but lacks the confidence. So when we're thinking about what makes good quality teachers, knowledge is of course important, but there are other attributes we need to consider. And I just want to give you a couple of examples to illustrate this relationship between knowledge and confidence in language teaching. Uh, the, first, the first story is um, about a young uh, teacher of English uh, in Korea. And um, this teacher of English was concerned about his own spoken competence in English. He lacked confidence in his own ability to speak English. And uh, for those of you who little, know a little bit about the, the, the context in Korea, um, the education system there has invested a lot in recent years in trying to increase the levels of spoken English, uh, not only among students, but among teachers. And it does remain a challenge for many teachers um, having enough confidence to speak English in class. And this, um, this teacher told me a, a story about being confronted in class by a student. And this is what the teacher said to me. He said, the student, so the student in his class, I think it was a secondary class, asked me to tell a funny story in English. So the student said to the teacher, can you tell us a funny story in English? And the, t the teacher said, honestly, no I cannot tell a story in English very well. 
And then he, the student, said to me, Why not? You are an English teacher. Do you think you are qualified to teach English while being a, unable to tell a story in English? And the teacher concluded by saying, so I felt very hurt indeed. Now the point here isn't that we should be able to tell funny stories in English. I'm probably not very good at that myself. And we're not saying that's how we measure good quality teachers. But the, the point of this story, the, the important point, is that there is an issue of confidence here. The teacher lacked confidence in his own spoken English. And, and this seemed to be noticed by the students who fairly or unfairly uh, raised it and asked him about it. And perhaps the teacher's own response to the question revealed their lack of confidence. Because perhaps a more confident teacher might have responded in a different way, might have tried to tell a story despite feeling they may have not been able to tell it very well. So I think confidence influences the way we react, we react to these kinds of situations. And in fact, if we think about the relationship between knowledge and confidence, I think there is a strong relationship. Teachers who are knowledgeable in an informed way tend to be more confident. That confidence disposes them to further learning. It makes them able to learn more and hence to acquire more knowledge. In contrast, teachers who lack confidence will tend to behave in a way which very often isn't beneficial for their learners. And here's another quote. Um, it says that teachers who lacked confidence uh, avoid situations where their confidence is low, which is a perfectly normal human response. We tend to avoid situations where we don't feel confident. These strategies, so the strategies teachers use when they lack confidence, generally mean keeping to safe topics and teaching methods, offering often impoverishing children's learning opportunities. So a teacher who lacks confidence isn't in a position to pro provide the best learning opportunities for the children they work with. And that's why building confidence is another important aspect of professional development programs such as ProELT. Here's a, another example of a teacher um, to illustrate this relationship between knowledge and confidence. This is a teacher I worked with many years ago. And to all intents and purposes, this teacher was very competent, was very experienced, um, was confident generally in teaching, but when I watched him teach, one thing I noticed uh, that whenever grammar came up, he always dealt with it very quickly. He always tried to say to learners, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that tomorrow, hoping perhaps that they would forget. Grammar was the one issue he seemed to be keen to avoid. And we talked a little, about, a little bit about this. And he said to me, well, I always have the feeling that I might be asked something that at, at that moment will catch me unawares, and I won't be able to answer at that time. So again, what we see here is a lack of confidence in an otherwise confident teacher. The lack of confidence led him to avoid teaching grammar, and that may not have been always beneficial for his students. Now again, a more confident teacher wouldn't necessarily worry about not knowing the answer all the time. You know, because when we're confident, we can say to learners, look, I haven't got the answer now, but I'll, I'll look into it and I'll come back to you. Or I don't have the answer now, let's investigate this together. Can you bring me some examples and we'll work on them? This is the response of a more confident teacher. So again, this illustrates this important connection, I think, between um, knowledge and confidence. And it was very interesting yesterday to hear the two Pro-L teachers who told us their stories, that there were references there to increased confidence. Teachers saying, I feel more confident, confident now in the classroom. And what that means is you're more willing to experiment. You're more willing to try things out. You're, you're more willing to learn from experience rather than playing it safe. And that's really, really important. So knowledge is important, teachers are essential, and that leads us to the question then, if we're going to set up professional development 
programs for teachers? What are the characteristics of professional development that works? And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to run through a number of characteristics based on international evidence, both in language teaching and in education more generally. And what I'd like you to be doing as I go through each um, characteristic is to think about a number of questions. First of all, is this characteristic part of ProELT? Can you see this characteristic in ProELT? And if you're a teacher on the program, you can think about that. If you're a trainer or a manager on the program, or involved in some other role, I think irrespective of your role, you can think about whether these characteristics are actually present in the program. So are these characteristics present in ProELT, number one? Number two, do they contribute in some way to the success of the program? In other words, can these characteristics help you understand why ProELT is working in the way it does, why it's having the impact it does? And another question you can think about, if you think that these characteristics are beneficial, in what ways? What kinds of impacts are they having on ProELT? So I'll go through these now, and we can think about each of them as I do. OK, so one, one essential characteristic of any effective professional development program, it's important to say, is that you have skilled trainers. Skilled trainers. Just as I said earlier, we can't have effective learning without good quality teachers. We can't have good quality teacher learning without effective trainers. Skilled trainers, and skilled trainers are not just experienced or well-qualified teacher. There is a difference between being a teacher and being someone who can support the development of other teachers. So the question then, is this part of ProELT? And I think I know the answer, but I just want you to think about these questions. Is this part of ProELT? Is ProELT, is part of the success of ProELT, can that be attributed to the role of trainers, to the presence of skilled trainers, to the preparation of trainers. A second important characteristic of effective professional development is classroom oriented. It's connected to what teachers are doing in the classroom. Now I still quite often hear teachers around the world complaining, saying we go to workshops, we go to training courses, and we don't feel they're relevant to our work. We can't use those ideas in our classrooms. It's still quite a common complaint that I hear from teachers. And I'm completely sympathetic. I'm completely sympathetic. Professional development is more effective when it connects with the classroom, where teachers can see the relevance of what they're learning to what they're expected to do in the classroom. And so the question again, is this part of the thinking behind ProELT. And again, just drawing on the testimonials we heard yesterday, that would seem to be the case. Now, when I, so, when I say that professional development should be connected to the classroom, I don't mean that it should be tips for teachers all the way. Okay, I think I need to make this clear. Um, this is a book. Um, it's not a language teaching book. And I don't think that a language teaching book with this title would be very popular. I can't imagine many teachers rushing out to buy a book with the title, Theory is Fun. And it's unfortunate because theory has a bad name very often among teachers. When they hear the, th when they hear the word theory, they say boring. Okay? And that's unfortunate. I'm, I'm, quite a, I'm quite a strong defender of theory. I think theory is important. Theory has, a, a, has an important role to play in professional development because without theory, what we do has no real grounding. Okay? So I don't think the problem is theory. The problem is the way teachers experience theory. Okay? The problem isn't theory itself. It's the way that theory is used in teacher education programs, in professional development programs. So one of my missions in life um, is to make theory uh, a more attractive proposition for teachers. It's not something I can do today. Um, but I just wanted to flag that. Saying that professional development should connect with the classroom doesn't mean it should be practical all the way. So to what extent does ProELT engage teachers in thinking about theory? To what extent does ProELT 
use theory in a way that teachers find useful and relevant? I think those are important questions to ask. Okay, a third, a third characteristic of effective professional development is contextualize. And there are two meanings to contextualize. First of all, it's sensitive to classroom realities. There's no point on a professional development program in, in introducing teachers to ideas which require technology if they haven't got technology in their classrooms. There's no point in encouraging teachers to use a wide range of resources if they have access to a very limited range of resources. These are complaints I hear in various parts of the world. Professional development will be more productive when it recognizes the realities that teachers work in and helps teachers work effectively within those realities. Contextualize also means that professional development is aligned with the system, with the broader system. So teachers on ProELT are part of the system, part of the Ministry of Education system. The ministry has a curriculum and teachers have a responsibility to work with that curriculum, to deliver that curriculum. Professional development needs to assist them in doing that rather than encouraging them, do, encouraging them to do things that perhaps create a conflict with the curriculum. So to what extent is ProELT doing that? To what extent does ProELT recognize the realities of the classroom? To what extent is ProELT aligned with the curriculum and other policies the ministry is trying to implement? The greater the degree of alignment, the more likely the positive impacts of the program will be. Is ProELT participant-centered? Is ProELT participant-centered? Because this is another important characteristic of effective professional development. Does it engage teachers in active learning? Are teachers learning by doing things, both experientially in the classroom and during workshops, perhaps, and in other ways? Now, this is really important because if part of the goal of ProELT is to encourage teachers in their classrooms to teach in a learner-centered way, then it's important that ProELT models that through its own training. In other words, there's no point in me telling you to be learner-centered if all I do is lecture to you. There's an obvious tension there. So as teacher educators, we have a responsibility to model the kinds of practices we expect teachers to use themselves. So it's all about practicing what we preach. So to what extent does ProELT do that? And is that a factor which is contributing to the impact of the program in the classroom? Do trainers practice what they preach? It's rather hot. It's rather hot, isn't it, in Malaysia whenever I come here. Um, although, as I said yesterday, I'm going on to Khartoum in a couple of days where I understand it's about 43 degrees at the moment, even hotter. So an, ice, an, iceberg, an iceberg may be a, wel a welcome um, break from that. Okay, my next, my next point has got to do with icebergs. So could I just ask you for a, for a very quick minute to talk to someone next to you? And the question is, what do teachers and icebergs have in common? What do teachers and icebergs have in common? Can you just have a quick chat about that for one minute? It's okay. Hello. Yes, please. Teachers, teachers are like uh, icebergs. Uh, if you don't give them the right context, they'll start to melt. Okay. Or the right situation. Thank you. Yes, I will just listen and nod, okay? I'm not necessarily going to comment. Thank you for that one. Yes. Two points. Teachers are cool. Teachers are cool. <laughs> and and eight-ninths of us are, all happen below the surface, not what you see. Okay. Um, I think it's like the iceberg. What is below the teacher's beliefs? that we don't see, we need to unpack them to bring up to the surface level. 
Okay, so a few comments about things beneath the surface there. Any other? Some people have said to me, teachers, uh, icebergs are hard and, te and teachers are hard as well. Um, that's another one people have come up in the past. Um, so the, the point here is the point that some of you have mentioned about what, what lurks beneath the surface. And as, as many of you will know, um, only a small proportion of an iceberg is visible. Uh, most of it is beneath the surface. And therefore we need to think about what lies beneath the surface when we think about teachers. We've got the observable part of teaching. We can see what teachers do. We can hear what teachers say. But beneath the doing and the saying, there's a lot more happening. Again, we've already referred, some of you referred to teachers' beliefs. Uh, we've talked about teacher knowledge. Uh, we've talked about confidence. These are all things that aren't immediately visible. They're lurking behind the surface, beneath the surface. And so when we, th when we think about this in the context of professional development, um, the term that very often comes up is, is, is constructivist. And a constructivist approach to learning generally simply means that it recognizes what's beneath the surface and builds on that in the course of learning. So effective professional development recognizes that teachers bring with them already a lot of experience, knowledge, beliefs, attitudes, feelings, things we can't necessarily see directly, but which are nonetheless extremely powerful in shaping what teachers do and in shaping how teachers learn. And effective professional development recognizes that and takes these factors into account. And as this quote says, it is, what it is widely recognized, widely recognized, that teacher education is more likely to impact on what teachers do, it's more likely to lead to change in what teachers do, if it also impacts on their beliefs and on these other hidden dimensions of teaching. So the question for us then is to what extent does ProELT address not just the observable dimension of teaching, but to what extent does it take into account and try to work with and build on the experience, the knowledge, the beliefs, the feelings that teachers bring with them? And if it does that, there's no doubt it's more likely to have an impact. It is possible to change teacher behavior without changing the deeper stuff. But what we know is that type of change tends to be short term. If we want longer term change, if we want sustained change, it's important not just to change the surface behaviors, but to change the thinking, the beliefs that underpins them, the attitudes as well. So I think that's another important um, consideration for the program to think about. Okay, a sixth important characteristic of effective professional development is that it's collaborative in nature. Collaborative as opposed to individualist. And when we think about learning as a collaborative activity, um, we're thinking of it as a social, as something that's social, which is driven by a common purpose. Teachers have a common purpose, a shared goal. And teachers have a willingness to share. And this is also important, particularly if you would like to see your learners working collaboratively. And again, it's, it's parallel to what I said earlier about student-centered learning. We can't have teacher education which is not participant-centered if we want teaching which is student-centered. We can't really have teacher education which is individualist if what we're hoping for is classroom learning that is collaborative. So if we want our learners in the classroom to be working together, to be learning together, it's important that teachers too are encouraged to learn in that way. And there's plenty of evidence to support the importance of a collaborative approach to professional development. Here's one statement which is perhaps quite extreme and takes it too far, but Johnson says teachers can only learn professionally in sustained and meaningful ways 
when they're able to do so together. Now maybe only is taking the argument a bit too far, but it does make the point, okay? Um, perhaps a more realistic comment on this issue. Um, teaching impro improves most, not only, but most in collegial settings where common goals are set and expertise is shared. So again, to what extent does ProELT encourage collaborative learning among teachers? To what extent does ProELT encourage teachers to share expertise, to learn from one another? The more it does that, I think, the better. Collaborative learning among teachers is also very important if we think about sustainability. ProELT, at some point, will end. I know we don't want to be thinking about this at this early stage, but all formal professional development programs end at some point. But the end of the formal program shouldn't be the end of professional development, shouldn't be the end of the learning process for teachers. And so we need to be thinking about how do we equip teachers during the program so that after the program they can continue learning independently or at least autonomously. And creating a collaborative culture is one answer to that question. If we can create a culture during the program through which teachers learn together, this is something teachers can continue doing after the program and therefore provides a sustainable form of teacher learning which will last. Okay, we're down to the last, last two or three. I don't really need to say much about this one because I, I am aware that promoting reflective teaching is um, a concern for ProELT. It's something it attempts to does. Um, I was asked to do a short webinar yesterday and I, and I, I did a little webinar about um, reflective teaching, which will be available on the ProELT website at some point soon. So I won't say too much about this now. Um, but being a reflective teacher, in essence, is about developing uh, a questioning attitude, a thoughtful attitude towards your work. Reflective teaching is not a procedure or an activity. It's a state of mind. It's a state of mind. So to what extent does ProELT encourage teachers to think about their work in a critical way, to inquire about teaching, to ask questions about teaching? Not necessarily difficult questions. Questions like, what do I do? Why do I do it? How effective is it? How do I know? These are simple but challenging questions which characterize the life of a reflective teacher. The other important element in reflective practice, of course, is that it's, it's evidence-based. It goes beyond saying, yeah, that was a good lesson, or that didn't work very well, and stopping there. It goes beyond that. It encourages us to ask questions, but also to collect evidence from our classrooms, from our teaching, which allows us to answer those questions. And of course, reflective practice can work very well when it's done collaboratively as well. Reflective practice is widely acknowledged as an important dimension in teacher learning, as this quote says. Most teacher educators would argue that reflection is an essential tool in professional development, and it's by far the most uh, contemporary or commonly discussed model of professional development in teacher learning today. And it's interesting to think about what is the difference between you know, non-reflective teaching and reflective teaching. And in essence, this diagram sums that up. Non-reflective teaching is just action. Action. Every day we go into the classroom and we act. We teach. We leave the classroom. We go into the classroom the next day or the next day and we act again. When we talk about reflective teaching, it's action, but we're constantly thinking about what we do, asking questions about what we do, learning about what we do and using what we learn to inform subsequent action. And you will have seen other um, pictures of reflective practice which break it down into you know, four or five stages. But in essence, it's this interaction between doing 
between teaching and between thinking about what we do and learning about it. It's interesting to, to look at different ways of thinking about teaching, different metaphors for teaching, and to see how reflective practice has come to have the important position it does. Um, maybe 30 years ago, the predominant metaphor for the teacher was the teacher as the robot. The teacher as the robot. And what does that mean when we think of teachers as robots? Well, it means that they don't really think very much, or they don't think at all for themselves, because robots don't, at least not yet. Um, it means that teachers can be programmed. If you're a robot, you can be programmed, and you will do what you're programmed to do without questioning, without digressing in any way. Okay? We know that this is not what teachers are. Teachers cannot be programmed. Teachers are active thinking decision makers who are constantly making judgments about what's right for their learners. So the idea of the teacher as a robot is obsolete now. Is obsolete. It's not a useful metaphor for teachers anymore. Then we've got the teacher as the craftsperson. Craftsman is so much easier to say, but the interest in the interest of uh, political correctness, we try to say craftsperson. Okay? Uh, the craftsperson. The teacher is the craftsperson. Well, what does that mean if the teacher is a craftsperson? It means that teachers learn by imitating. That's how you learn a craft. You observe a more experienced master, a more experienced practitioner, and you copy what they do. You imitate their skilled behaviors in order to become skilled yourself. And of course, we can learn as teachers by observing others. We can learn by observing others. We're not saying that's not important. But the limitation of the craft model is that it was imitation without thinking, imitation without questioning, imitation very often without understanding. And that's what we want to avoid. Because it then, what we have is a very conservative model. It means teaching never changes. Because I, cha I teach in the way that the teacher I observed taught. And then the next person who observes me will teach in the same way. So we end up with a very conservative system which never changes. So learning from others is good, but we need to have questioning, thinking involved there, understanding. Another way of thinking about teaching is the teaching as the applied scientist. Now, the applied scientist is primarily concerned with theory. With theory. The applied science busies themselves learning theory and then applying it to practice. And again, we can see what this means for teaching. If we think of teachers as applied sciences, what this means is that all teachers need to be good teachers is lots of theory. And again, we know that's not the case. There's plenty of evidence that teachers who are very knowledgeable in a theoretical sense are not automatically good teachers. But as I said earlier, I'm not saying that theory isn't important. Theory has a role to play, um, but on its own, it's not enough. Which is why we've come to the reflective model today, the idea of the reflective teacher. And the reflective teacher allows us to learn from others. The reflective, teach, the reflective model allows us to learn from theory and to use theory. But what's important about the reflective model is that it emphasizes thinking, understanding, constant questioning, constant inquiry. It doesn't encourage imitation without understanding. It doesn't encourage the application of theory in a blind sense. And we can see then historically why the reflective model has come to assume the important position it has today. So to what extent does ProEL encourage reflective teaching? How does it do it? And what evidence is there that that is beneficial? Professional development is important when it's sustained. It's sustained. When we think of teacher learning as a process, not as a one-off event. And again, if we think about ProELT, I don't think there's any doubt that it does that because ProELT happens over a period of time, an extended period of time, as opposed to, say, a one-off workshop. And again, there's been plenty of commentary on this in the literature. Um, the traditional reliance on 
short workshops for teachers is no longer considered to be an effective model for professional development, for sustained professional development. The short-term one-off workshop is no longer considered to be an effective model if we're interested in sustained change. And this source here talks about the need to shift professional development you know, from one-time workshops to more ongoing and job-embedded professional learning. So to what extent does ProEL do that? To what extent does, can, this, um, can the achievements of ProELT be attributed to this kind of model? And finally, effective professional development is empowering. Empowering. What does empowering mean? Well, it means it promotes confidence, it builds motivation, and encourages autonomy. I think these are three characteristics of empowered teachers. They are confident, they are motivated, and they, hit, they feel they have autonomy. And autonomy isn't a concept that we should be worried about. Autonomy doesn't mean that we're free to do whatever we like. No one's free to do whatever we like. Autonomy for me means you're in a position to make informed decisions about your work, to make appropriate decisions about your work, because you have the knowledge to do so. So to what extent does ProELT empower teachers? To what extent does it promote motivation, confidence, and autonomy? So questions for all of you, really. Questions for all of you. I've gone through a number of characteristics, which, you know, based on international experience of teacher education, in language, teaching, and more generally, are considered to make a difference to the success of professional development. And as I said, the question, the question for all of you, for all of us, is to what extent does ProELT incorporate these characteristics? Where it does, in what ways are these characteristics making a difference to the success of the program? How do you know what evidence have you got and this is a, a very often a challenging one, that these characteristics are actually making a difference. And what kind of difference? And if we don't have the evidence, how do we go about obtaining it? And it's important when we talk about the success, the success of the program, what does that actually mean? Well, we know that success means improved language ability, because that's, ver that's a very explicit goal of the program. And we probably know that success means changes in classroom practice. But success can mean much more than that. I think it's important to be aware that the program may be beneficial in ways that go way beyond the formal objectives that is set for itself. So when we think about the impact of professional development, I think it's important that we think broadly. So we've got impacts on knowledge, which we've talked about. So is ProELT impacting on teacher knowledge, both in terms of language and both sort of theoretically in terms of what they know about teaching? Is it impacting on teaching in the way teachers plan, in the way teachers teach? Is it impacting on what we might call the effective side of teaching, confidence, motivation, um, beliefs? And is it impacting on teacher's capacity to learn professionally? Is ProELT equipping teachers to learn professionally by encouraging them to reflect, to become autonomous, and to collaborate? So when I look at a program like ProELT, I see enormous potential for all kinds of impacts. And I said, many of these may extend beyond the formal goals of the program, but I think it's important to be alert to them and because they can demonstrate the way in which the program is contributing um, in many, many different ways. So I hope there are some ideas there for you to think about. As I say, my role, I've seen my role is to encourage you to question what you're doing, why it's working, how it's working. Okay? And I hope that these kinds of issues frame the sessions which we're going to have later in the day, and which I look forward to attending. 
You've got the address there once again if you'd like to download a copy of the slides. And thank you very much for listening. And I think we've got some time for questions. Yes, I think, yes. As long as they're not about Malaysian food. It doesn't have to be a question, of course. It can be a comment. It can be you may want to relate your experience to something I've said. You may want to disagree with something I said. Um, so any, any kind of contribution, I think, is welcome. Uh, I'm Ajibin Zahir, and I'm a trainer. And I would also like to share that I have read your article when I was doing my MA TESOL in Canterbury Christchurch University. And I'm very happy to see you today here. I thought Simon Borg was a very old man. But <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see you. Thank and you very I much. Will, I will let my other class fellows know that I met you, you know. Thank That's you. going to be another edge on my part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, regarding the features that you uh, mentioned, uh, today, I am very confident to say that definitely the teachers are being empowered. And the example is that they are here today with their kids back home, dads looking after them, and they took this decision to be here, you know, because they put their career <coughs> and their profession at a priority. The thought pro health was giving them something and they are confident about it. And I, 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 I can see that they are empowered as far as my teachers are concerned. So definitely that feature is there on the pro -earth. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, those are the kind of you know, real life experiences we, we, we like to hear because they do make the points, uh, I think, in a, in a much more vivid way. Um, th than I ever can. So Perelt is empowering teachers but making fathers across the land somewhat unhappy perhaps, but that's okay, we can, we can deal with that. Any other, any other contributions of any kind, please? Okay, uh, well, um, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Sharifa Sabira. I'm teaching uh, with, uh, please, for, for the first time, I would like to say Please forgive me if uh, I'm, I'm not a good English speaker. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, what I want to talk about is based on my experience teaching uh, primary school, I do agree when we talk about reflective teaching. Okay, based on my experience, I always do the reflective things in my, uh, when I finish doing my teaching. Okay, when I finish teaching, when I do reflections, I notice that there is improvement in my lesson, which is now what I want to share with you is based on my experience writing the reflective, writing the reflections, I notice that I can improve the strategy and methods used in my classroom. It is very important for me because I can evaluate, evaluate the step taking in the uh, teaching itself. So I'm not a good English teacher, but every time when I do it, I think I really improve from time to time. And I still keep doing it until today. So I think by doing the reflective things, it's going to help the teachers to be better in their teaching proficiency. That's it. Yes, and, and the point here, the important point is that we're thinking about, uh, about development as a teacher, as an ongoing process, isn't it? And, and I think your, your comments illustrate that perfectly. It's not about anyone saying, I'm developed and therefore I stop. We never reach that point. Um, but the idea is to have that mindset which allows you to be open to constantly becoming better at what you do, no matter how good you already are. So thank you for, for those comments. I think we had something over there. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning and salam satu Malaysia. Uh, my name is Sarah. My trainer is Miss Alice Kani. I just would like to say to BC that you do really have a very good trainer because I'm under Miss Alice Kani and we are blessed to have her and uh, we are so happy and uh, her experience that really motivate us and uh, what I believe is that our attitude as a teacher, 
we do have, you must have a very good attitude. However, whatever good, whether, whether the program is so good, so great, whatever, but uh, our attitude, pro else and the teacher's attitude. Whether you want to improve yourself is B2, C1, C2 is just a number to me, to all our friends here, even though we get B1, whatever. But uh, attitude, that is what I believe. Thank you so much. Yes. <clears throat> Yes, I couldn't agree more. I mean, B1, C2, they are, they are numbers. They, in, in some senses, are important numbers, but much more important is the attitude. The attitude that ProELT is creating, the culture of teacher learning that ProELT Pro is, is creating. And what I hear so far, it's a, it's, a, it's a culture where teachers want to learn, are open to learning, and that's, of course, more valuable in many ways than any test score uh, can be. So thank you as well for that one. Yes, please, yes. Hello. Okay, good morning, everyone. I just want to say one thing. As a teacher, you must prepare yourself for 21st, 21st century education. That's all, and be positive, and positive in all the attitude, of course, and think out of box. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning to all. Just one thing I would like to add is intrinsic motivation. As a teacher, I think it is very important for all of us to have interest, uh, interest in, uh, intrinsic uh, motivation because um, I'm as a young teacher, very new, very novice. And um, I think motivation does play a major role in our life, especially as a teacher. Interesting, in inner motivation, of course. Thank you. That was very, very fluently spoken for a nervous teacher, so perhaps not as nervous as you, as you think. Yes, in, intrinsic motivation is an interesting one. We heard those uh, stories yesterday um, where we were told that at the beginning of the program, teachers were very angry. And that suggests that, at least initially, the motivation wasn't there. But over time, the motivation has been created. And this is what we're saying. Even if it's not necessarily there at the beginning, an effective professional development program will create that motivation, will help teachers to see the value of the learning they're experiencing. And that seems to be the case with ProEL. Even teachers who were initially unconvinced are now, over time, increasingly more convinced about the value. Yes. Hello. Oh, there we go. Um, I just wanted to say quickly that while so many of the teachers are eagerly expressing that they have so much to learn and that they're in the process and being so, so humble about their own abilities, as a trainer, I learned so much from this community of amazing teachers. Um, <laughs> Truly, I feel incredibly blessed and motivated to be working with a community of teachers who come and put themselves into this with their whole hearts. Um, it makes my job delightful and motivates me to learn as well. I learn so much from my teachers. Thank you very much for making it so pleasurable. Okay, so I, I, I believe that is all we have time for at the moment, but of course this is just the start of the conversation. Hopefully we're all around for, is it coffee now or not? I don't want to create a stampede if it isn't coffee. Yeah, okay, someone will tell you what's happening. Uh, thank you again for listening. I look forward to continuing conversations with you during the day. Okay.